That's fine. You think? I'll turn that off so it's Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Those of you who are here, those of you who are online, uh, welcome to you as well. It's great to see you. Obviously, lots of folk on holiday. It's that kind of uh, time of year. And I mean, there's people chatting away outside uh, who will come in shortly, I'm sure. Um, anyway, it's great to see you. Uh, whether you're here regularly or you're visiting, uh, you're very welcome. I've got a number of things that I want to run through uh, just to, to tell you about. Uh, tonight, from 7 until 8, we have our uh, time for prayer, and uh, because it's the last Sunday in the month, we also, uh, tonight, will share communion. So it's online, it's on Zoom, um, and if you don't get our weekly update where the link is, then you can email pastoral at barktheview4.org.uk, and you get through uh, to the lovely Elaine, uh, and she will give you uh, the link for, uh, for tonight. Over the next couple of uh, uh, Sunday evenings, we are doing some prayer ministry training. So at the end, um, and sometimes during services in the future, we will be offering the opportunity for folks to have prayer. Uh, and we uh, want to do that wisely and properly and sensibly. Um, and so we want those folks who are going to be involved in it to, to have some uh, sort of training so they kind of know what they're doing. Um, and so that's going to be uh, the next uh, two Sundays uh, from 6.30 until 8 o'clock in the Pillar Hall, which if you don't know is where you've just come in from. So through there, uh, uh, there's a load of pillars in there, so that's the clue. Uh, and at the end of the service today, we're going to have tea and coffee uh, through there uh, as well. And you're welcome uh, to stay uh, for that and, uh, and chat to folk. If you um, are, would like to find out Without saying, I am definitely signing up for this, I'm definitely going to do this prayer stuff, if you would just like to find out a little bit more, then let Elaine know, uh, that's pastoral, at barthaviewfloor.org.uk, um, and uh, we'll get your name down, just so that we kind of know uh, who's, who's going to be around. Just up the street here, facing the park, we have uh, student accommodation. And th this whole area is full uh, of student uh, accommodation. And we know that um, folks uh, like Central and Kings are, are doing lots of work with students, but there are lots of other students still around the place. Um, and um, given that they are our neighbours, we would quite like to get to know them a little bit. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, inviting, particularly the folks next door, but, but in the area, uh, our students to join us for a pie and a pint at the Golf Tavern, which again is just up the road, the other side of the students. So we're keeping it kind of close uh, in, in geographical uh, terms. But if you know folk that you would like to, to invite along to that, then come along uh, on Tuesday, the 20th of September. I've given you plenty of notice, right? So you get time to think, who will I bring? Right? And at that night, we are also going to advertise our Alpha course which starts the following Tuesday, also in the Golf Tavern. Uh, and I have to say that we uh, want to acknowledge uh, the folks at the Golf Tavern who are giving us the space for free, uh, which is uh, very kind and generous of them. Uh, and we'll be there. Uh, they've got a room upstairs, uh, so we're going to use that room. Uh, and so the introduction for the pie and the pint, get to know some of the students, hopefully, uh, and also the chance to invite folk to Alpha. Even if you don't want to come to the pie and the pint, Think about who you might bring to Alpha, because it's a chance uh, just to share um, God's love with people uh, in a kind of informal uh, setting. I was very fortunate uh, when I was doing my training for ministry to be able to spend my summer placement in Arizona. See, when people now think, where would you like to go and think, oh, I might go to the Highlands or, you know, I might go and be a chaplain somewhere. I instantly thought, I would like to go to Arizona because we had a contact with the congregation out there and it was great. One of the things that we learned out there was they do this thing called dinner for eight. And they do dinner for eight because their houses are huge. At least the folks that we went to visit, right? Huge. So they could do dinner for eight quite happily. But when we came back, we thought, houses in Prestwick, Mm, not so huge. So we did dinner for six. And it was an opportunity 
simply for people in the congregation to get to know each other. I mean, I know, I know you find it hard to believe, but in some congregations, we have upstairs folk and downstairs folk, and never the two shall meet. Hmm? And there are folk in congregations who have been going for years, and they might know your face, but they've got no idea who you are. They don't know anything about you. And so here's an opportunity to get to know other people. And the idea is that over a, a three-month period, your group of six gets together three times to eat a meal together. And it's up to you how you want to do that. Over the years, we have had like silver service. And the lady was, I've never done this before. I've had all this stuff sitting for years and I just thought I'm going to put it out. So we had the lovely centerpiece. It was great. And then she said, of course, I don't cook. <laughs> so we had Marks and Spencers. Great, absolutely great. Equally, we've gone to places and we've had the Chinese takeaway menu handed to us. There you go. Pick something for you. And that's okay because it's not about the food and it's not about the house and it's not about the size of all of that. It's about building relationships with each other. It's about eating a meal together and getting to know one another. So we're not looking at the size of your space. We're, we're, we're not looking at the quality of the food. It's not a competition. It's simply about building relationships. And so what we've tended to do, although you can do whatever you like, what we have tended to do is to have one lot, one couple or one pair or one group host one of the events. And that lot will, because it's their house, do the main course. And the others who are coming can bring a pudding or some cheese and biscuits or some juice and wine or whatever. Sort it yourselves. Right? It's very flexible because it's just about getting together and getting to know each other in the congregation to build relationships. And so we're going to start, hopefully, if anybody's interested and wants to sign up, we're hoping to start this so that we'll do September, October, and November will be the three months during which in your groups, you will get to have three meals together. Now, I know, we all know, that there are folks who are twos. There are families of fours and fives. There are ones. And that's okay. Because what we'll do is mix you up into groups. So some groups might be eights. Of course, there's a four. Some groups might have four ones and a two. Although we're not trying to set you up. Right? I just need to make that clear, right? Just, <laughs> there's not, none of that going on. Okay? But, but it's, it's about mixing and matching. So, so some of you know everybody, right? And so you can be in a group and you'll know everybody. Others, you might be in a group where you don't know anybody else. And here's an opportunity just to spend time talking together and getting to know each other. So if you're interested in being part of that, then please contact Julie at the office, who's sitting there going, you never told me about this. Right? Contact Julie at the office. Uh, that's admin at barclayviewforth.org.uk um, or just chat to her and give her your name and then we'll uh, take the names of the folks uh, that are getting involved and we'll sort that out uh, and get it together. I decided to do that today because actually today we're kind of thinking about kind of being neighborly. And so uh, getting to know each other, I think, is, is kind of part of being neighborly just with folks in the congregation. But we're here because we, we've come to worship. And one of my favorite um, verses comes from the very beginning of the book that we're working through uh, in John's Gospel. And in the message version of the New Testament, it says this, Jesus moved into our neighborhood. I think that's amazing that God chose to move into this world. I think it's fantastic. I think it's great news 
And I think it's news that we need to share. And so we come to worship that Jesus who is still in our neighborhoods. He's still at work, even in ways that we have not begun to imagine yet. And we need to find out where he's working and join in. But for now, we come to, to enjoy his company and his presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we come to worship. And we're going to sing together the hymn, In Christ Alone. <laughs> morning from my side as well to all of you and I would like to take a moment to pray together. Abba, I thank you for everyone joining us today, be it here or uh, from the comfortable side of a couch or chair. I thank you that you form neighborhood, that you are in our neighborhood and that you form community in it. And I pray that all these experiences we make here with one another, all those experiences yet to come, that they continue to 
form us towards you. I pray that you bless this family, this church family, and that it, yeah, that it will be welcoming and continues to be welcoming, loving, generous. And together we pray with the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So, how many of you are absolutely devastated that Neighbours has finished? Two? That's it, two. One, one, one. Really, I thought there might have been more than that. You see, it was part of my formative years. I remember the first episode. We used to hurry home and have the tea so that we could watch Neighbours just before the news because it was on at half past five and BBC does this. And, ah, oh, the stories, the excitement, the sun, all of that. Ah, oh, it, was, it was wonderful. I have some photos that I want to show you. There we go. That's in Australia. And that, we walked along that beach. It's really, really long beach. Beautiful. Beautiful beach. It's not a neighbor's beach. It's the competition's beach. For those of you who watch Home and Away. Does anybody watch Home and Away? Nobody's admitting to it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next one. There you go. You can't really see it there, but that says Summer Bay. Because Home and Away is set in Summer Bay. Erinsborough was the fictional neighbor's area. Summer Bay for Home and Away. And then... <laughs> right, okay, what can I say? It's winter time in Australia when we go in the summer. Right? And that's my, I have to say, that's my ideal beach outfit. Long sleeves to cover up the bits that I don't want to get burnt. I normally have a hat on. Thankfully, I did not in that picture because that's just a sight not, that sh nobody should see. But there you go, Summer Bay Surf Rescue. They're all like, oh, it's great. And they leave that there because, you know, it's, it's actually called um, Palm Beach. But for everybody there, it's just Summer Bay. It's also a program about neighbours. You, you guys are all too young. I suspect you've not seen Home and Away or Neighbours, and it's not a bad thing, really. But it's, all, it's stories about neighbours. It's stories about people who get to know each other. It's stories about, about being friends and falling out and making up and all of that kind of stuff. Kind of what life is like. The story that we're going to read today is about a woman who traditionally we have thought wasn't a particularly good neighbor because she has lots of husbands. And the idea behind that is thinking, well, how did she get them? How did she woo these husbands? What was going on there? So the, the men might have been a, a bit wary of her and the women certainly would have been a bit wary of this woman. And so she's ended up out in the middle of the day getting water. That's a kind of traditional picture of this lady. Not a particularly nice lady, not a particularly good neighbor. Jesus was asked a question about the most important things that we can do and can be. The most important things that human beings can do or can be. And you know, he said the first thing is to love God. And the next thing 
is to love your neighbor. Love other people. And so that raised a question. Who's my neighbor? Well, we've got a few people living in the house next door to us, and there's, well, depends on how many of the children are home, but there's a few living across the road from us, and there's a, a single lady next door on the other side. They, they're, they're our neighbors. But does it just mean love them? No, you're, no, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. It means love people. Love all of those folk that you come across every day in life. And you know what? That's hard because some of them are nice. I mean, you should see our, our, our team meetings for the staff. Whoa, right? Do you know some of the things we've got to put up with? Oh, dear me. But we're told we've got to love them. Sometimes it's hard. I'm joking, okay? I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm joking when I say that. But it's not always easy to love people. We know that. And actually, sometimes we are not all that easy to love. But Jesus says, that's the best thing that we can do. First of all, love God, and then love your neighbor. We're going to sing. We're going to sing. I'll go anywhere. Oh, I need to do that too. If you remember a little bit, you know the song. Otherwise, just jiggle. That there has a line, don't, don't, oh, you're going to get back up in a minute, has a line that says, you're the adventure of a lifetime, Jesus. You take my heart and make it wild. And I love that idea. And then in the second bit it says, there's no map for where your wild heart takes us. I don't know about you, but I want to follow a Jesus who has a wild heart and who makes my heart wild. That fills me with passion and excitement and enthusiasm for life and for him. It sometimes takes you to places that you don't expect. So all those years when I said, I'm never going to be a minister... 
that turned out to be stupid. Because here I am. Why? Because at some point you have to choose. Are you going to follow him? Really follow him regardless of the cost or not? Two folk who are in that process of following Jesus and working out what's coming next. Fiona and Stephanie. So I would like you to come up. This is Stephanie. This is Fiona. So, Stephanie, you've been here longer, so we'll start with you. All right. Why were you here? I was just talking about it yesterday, actually, because um, the job description I found on the web page back then, uh, about four years ago, um, was dated to March only. And I thought, if it's still up, I just apply and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, and that's how I got here. But actually it was, the deadline was for March. So, and I thought, I'll just, I'll just see, I'll apply. And they were still looking for someone. So that's why I'm here. But uh, yeah, but and for my PhD. <laughs> so, so you came to study. Yes, I came to you study. Came to yes. To study. Um, PhD. <laughs> we, we wish you terribly well with that because we know it's Thank coming to you. an end. Um, Fiona, you've not been here so long, so why are you here? No, I've just been here since um, 1st of August last year, doing my probationary year for ordained local ministry. Something but, I never thought I would hear myself say either. <laughs> but when you follow God, you go anywhere. Absolutely. Nobody knows what ordained local ministry is. Can you tell us what it is? You mean I've been here a year and they still don't know? <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I've trained alongside ministers for the last three years and they still don't know either what it is. It's part-time ministry. It's full ministry and if it's ordained, we can do the sacraments once I'm ordained, but it's part-time. Um, not full-time like David. You won't have a church on your own. It's working in a team um, as part-time ministry. But ordained? But are dangerous. Okay. So, what Stephanie has been the best thing about being part of Barclayview for over these years? You know, I had no advance notice for this, which would be nice. <laughs> you should <laughs> know by now. Because there were so many things to pick from. But um, I think it's different things. So, I would say that... I, yeah, I was writing my journal yesterday and I thought that what I wrote, jotted down was, it was a very good, um, challenging time, but I needed them as much as they needed me. So, and I think I'm, I'm, that's what I'm truly thankful for because I've encountered so many um, different people and spiritualities in this time here that, that really enriched me, challenged me, and helped me to grow. And I must say, you kiddos, you also have brought so much joy. Um, you know, first doing that next room and now the AKA room and all the different bits we had and then for a long time online, you know, that was just really special. Being here, being part of this community, growing here together and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. I think people make, make a place, and you've all been very friendly towards me um, over the past year. But I think I'll also remember, I always thought I was good at crafts until I had to try and sew a yellow canary. <laughs> <laughs> and even worse, standing at the tent in the Meadows Festival attempting to fold this piece of paper into a spin <laughs> was just impossible. But those are certainly highlights. Um, boxes. I could not believe the number of boxes, shoe boxes for Blyswood that I had to check the day that I was here. They just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. So I'll certainly always remember that. But I think working with people, working with Connect Plus was really excellent and great as well. So I think it's people that you remember from a place. It's people that make a church. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that's the kind of good bit. Mm-hmm. 
you've obviously seen a whole range of things that have been going on here. Mm-hmm. What do you think we need to work on? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's okay, because she's well. going. She can say whatever she likes. <laughs> um, I think... Lord, give me words. Uh, (laughs) But no, I think that one challenge I came across at different points throughout these past years, um, I wish there would have been a productive feedback culture. I think giving feedback is a really difficult thing, giving good feedback and uh, constructive feedback needs to be learned. You know, I mean, there's a reason why there are seminars for these things. Um, but I do think that that is something mm-hmm. that, w- that could be developed, mm-hmm. thrown in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You asked me the same question. Mm-hmm. Same question, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a difficult question. But I think just to keep on following, following God following Jesus and we know that for the churches in Edinburgh over the next few months life's going to be difficult the next few months and years so really it is just to keep following Jesus our leader and our master and our friend and have mission at the forefront of everything we do to build the kingdom and we can't go far wrong with that Amen. okay so you're both this is your last day for both of you and uh, you're going on to do well what are you going on to now? That's a good question. So um, I will hopefully uh, finish my thesis this year. Mm-hmm. So finish means finish writing it. And then uh, there's still going to be the Viva, etc. But this is what I am now working on and putting my energy in um, to finish this first bit of a, I think, yeah, you can say almost, it's the first bit of a life's work, I think you feel at this stage. So, yeah. And then, I don't know. <laughs> so, there is no map, literally. Yeah. And, and physically, emotionally, I, I have no idea what's going to happen because um, it's, it's where the jobs are, where the calling mm-hmm. is, very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fiona? Well, hopefully, Presbyter will actually give a date for my ordination. <laughs> Well, we'd hope to have had one today to tell you, but David can let you know when it is. Um, For the month of August, I'm doing pulpit supply in a couple of churches. And then, once I'm ordained, you will still see me around because I'm going to be working as my deployment in the four churches that are in the new grouping. So, ourselves here, Craig Lockhart, Polworth and St Michael's. We're based at Polworth, but working across the union. So, you will still see me from time to time. So, it's only au revoir. Au revoir. Okay. Good. Um, I'm going to pray for them now, um, Stephanie first and then uh, Fiona. And just because of COVID and all that things, I, I would normally ask folk to come out and, and lay hands on and do that, but we're not doing that today. So I'm going to do that on your behalf, but if you would like to or are willing to, if you would just hold your hand out towards them as I'm praying, uh, that's just a, a sign that you... Uh, that you are in sympathy and agree, uh, and you're, you're praying God's blessing uh, on each of them as well. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for Stephanie, for her willingness to follow you, for her uh, willingness to, to take that step uh, and <laughs> apply for a job that uh, the date had passed. We're glad that she was here. We're grateful for the the talent and the ability, the gifting that she brought to the role. We thank you for her faithfulness. We thank you that she has followed you and she has led our young people and she has led us to grow deeper with you. We pray that you would make her heart wild that she would know your peace and your presence, that you would give her uh, the the wherewithal to to get the studying done, to get the research done and the writing done, to to do that part of this next stage of the journey. And then whatever you have for her, 
we know it will be good. And so we pray that you will walk with her into whatever comes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you too for Fiona, for her time with us, for her call to ministry, for the gifts that you've given her, for the way that she's been able to use them in this place over these months. We thank you for what she's taught us, for what she's brought to us. We thank you for the call that you have on her life, for, for the different experiences she's had that she's able to bring into ministry. And Father, we, we, we sometimes struggle a little bit with presbytery and how it operates, but Father, we thank you that here we are at this stage where that call has been confirmed and where in due course Fiona will be ordained into ministry. Whatever comes of the, the grouping and of that uh, work that's to be done in, in taking forward the idea of bringing us together, we pray that you would give her wisdom, that you would give her compassion and strength, the ability to say no when she needs to. Father, we thank you for all that there is in Fiona's future, and we look forward to being able to share in some way in that. Amen. Just before you disappear... We have some gifts for you. Thank you. And I'll let you open that and show people. Thank you. Gorgeous. You trust me to put this back in this box? <laughs> For those of you who are uh, uncertain of what they are, it's a, a model of the church. <laughs> so, so you never forget, okay? Yes. Thank you very much. There's, there's, no, you. there's no getting away from it. Do you know what? I'm just going to give you that. You <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to sing together, I heard the voice of Jesus say, and then we'll have our Bible reading.
As David said, we're going to be hearing the story about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, which can be found in John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Amen. Let us pray together. Living, loving Lord, we have heard your voice asking us to come to you and lay our burdens before you, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we know that you are the living water that gives us life, that we can come before you with all our worries, all our concerns, all our fears, and that you will hear and answer us. And so we come before you now with our concerns for this world around us. Lord, it often seems that we live in a dark place at the moment, in a place that seems to be getting darker each day. And we ask for your light to shine in our world, for your presence to be made known in our world, 
in our nation, in our city, that lives may be transformed and renewed. We pray for the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. We ask that your peace may be known there, that there could be a stop to the fighting. And we ask that you would be with those who have lost loved ones on both sides of the conflict, that they may know your peace. We pray for all those who have fled war-torn countries, that they find shelter and safety here in our city as well as in other cities and places. We pray especially for Edinburgh City Mission and all the good work that they do amongst refugees. We pray that they have all the resources they need for this valuable work. Lord, we hear so much on the news at the moment about the rising cost of living. There seems to be disruption in many different areas of our lives. And we pray for those for whom this is a real concern. We pray for those who are facing poverty, for those who are afraid they will not have enough money to feed their families or heat their homes this winter. We ask that our government would step in and help in a very practical and real way. And so we pray for the leaders of our land that they might pause and use this time over the summer months to reflect honestly and to seek your guidance for the future. But even in this darkness, Lord, you are there and there are signs of your light shining in our land and our city. We give you thanks for the work of Scripture Union and the camps that have been happening over the summer and those that are still to happen in the remaining few weeks of summer. We thank you for the many leaders who have given up their time to run these camps and for all the young people who have gone to them and who have come to know you better or come to know you for the first time. And so we pray for the remaining camps this summer that they go well. We pray for safety for everyone who attends and for a real sense of your presence. We pray also for the many holiday clubs that have been happening in churches and for those that are still to happen in the coming weeks. And again, we ask for a sense of your presence and for meaningful relationships with all the young people who attend them. Lord, we know that we are your hands and feet in this world, and so we seek your guidance as to how we can help to transform and renew our society, embolden and encourage us in our daily lives that we may share your love with those around us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. No. So, we have been working through John's Gospel. And here we are at chapter 4 and this story. And it starts with Jesus and his friends going up through Samaria. And that's um, the name given to the bit of land uh, in the, the north and Judea to the south. But it's a strange thing to do. They didn't get on, the Jews and the Samaritans. They weren't good neighbors. They didn't make good friends. Didn't work. So they find themselves going to a place that they didn't really understand why Jesus was taking them there. Sometimes a newspaper or a magazine runs a feature, what's wrong with this picture? And it's not that it's a bad picture. It's just that there's something in it that kind of doesn't make sense. And that's what John's doing here in this story. He's saying, you know, here's, here's the story, but actually there are things in it that just don't quite make sense. Jesus was already known as a holy man. And so for him to enter into conversation with this woman on her own, that was just kind of weird. That didn't happen in those days, particularly uh, holy people. They didn't associate with, with or, or be um, alone with, with people who were not close family members. 
So that's the first thing that was a bit odd for John. Secondly, there's a, a couple of hundred years of animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so he writes, they did not associate. Really? <laughs> Do you know? There's an understatement. They hated each other. They did not associate. Terribly, terribly correct. Thirdly, historically people, have, as I said earlier, have assumed that this woman is of really dubious character. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe that's why she was there at that point in the day. Maybe not. But what we do know is that despite all of that, Jesus engages this woman in conversation. But it's a, a, a kind of strange conversation. It's a kind of teasing, double-meaning kind of conversation. And again, that's typical of the way John writes stuff. When you read the gospel, again and again, John shows Jesus talking to people and they don't understand what he's talking about. Last chapter, we had Nicodemus who's told, you must be born again. Well, can you just imagine? How am I going to get back in there? <laughs> it's not going to work. Jesus is talking on a heavenly level, and they're thinking on an earthly level. Jesus, when asking for a drink, tells the woman that actually she should have asked him for one. Of course, she thinks in the ordinary earthly sense, and that would never have happened. She would never have done that. It wasn't right to do that. But he's talking about something different. The clue that he means something different is found in that phrase, living water. I will give you living water. It's a phrase that people use for what we call running water. Isn't it great in the heat of the day to be at a river? And you can go and you can stick your feet in the water and you can, if you're lucky, you can maybe watch fish or catch fish or swim in the river. It's great. Running water, it's great. Jesus, of course, isn't referring to physical water at all, whether it's still or moving. He's referring to the new life that he offers to all of us. And this conversation shows that anyone, anyone at all, no matter their gender, their geography, or their racial or moral background, anyone is welcome to receive the life that Jesus offers. And he's talking about this spiritual thing. Not only will the, the water that he offers quench your thirst so that you'll never be thirsty again, it will become a spring inside you itself bubbling up refreshing you and others with the life that comes through him by the Holy Spirit. He comes back to that later in the, in the book in chapter 7. But the woman doesn't really get what Jesus is talking about. However, she is interested. Her interest is stimulated and she wants to know more. But of course, as everyone who starts to take Jesus seriously finds, she's in for a bit of a shock. He has living water to offer her. But when you start to drink it, it changes every area of your life. Often it's when people bring their lives into the light of Jesus that things begin to come clear. A surrounding culture tries to tell us that everything is okay. By subtle and not so subtle ways, they suggest the world is just as it is. Just take it as it is. Everything's fine. It's all okay. It's all good. You don't just go with the flow. You know, all of that. But what the gospel does is to shine a light onto that, to kickstart the brain, to see things differently. Often when people are introduced to Jesus, the reaction is just like this woman here. She was intrigued by Jesus and his offer of living water. So intrigued, in fact, that she asked to have some not realizing that if you take Jesus up on his offer of running pure, living water bubbling up inside you, you need to get rid of the stale, moldy, stagnant stuff you've been living off. And Jesus saw straight to what was going on in her life. This woman was of no standing. She had nothing going for her. In Jesus' day, women couldn't divorce a man. Only men had that right. Therefore, when Jesus says she's had five husbands and was now living with a man that was not her husband, the implication is that she had been personally rejected by these five husbands. Can you imagine what that's done for her self-esteem 
and her confidence. It's possible that she was not the brazen hussy that she's been made out to be all these years. Maybe she felt rejected, alone, shameful, and she was going from man to man trying to find somebody that would just love her and care for her. This woman has a life composed of one upheaval after another with enough husbands coming and going to keep all the gossips in the town talking for weeks. We assume that her various marriages ended in divorce and not with the death of her husbands. However, it may have been, of course, that she was an obnoxious, vicious harpy and the men divorced her because they couldn't take any more. <laughs> we don't know. But we make lots of assumptions about her and they're not all good. We don't know what traumas in her background may have made it hard for her to form lasting bonds. But she knew her life was in a mess and she knew that Jesus knew. I think sometimes God gives that gift to people. Insight into a person's life and situation. You might be talking to or praying for someone and a word or a phrase or an image comes to mind and when you share it, the other person knows that it's from God. I've experienced that from, from both sides, for people praying for me and in praying for others. Some people I think are particularly gifted in that. But I think anyone can learn to be better at it. And so, over the next two Sunday nights, there's training to help us. But the woman's reaction to the revelation of knowledge by Jesus is a classic example of what anyone who's ever led in a church knows. You put your finger on a sore spot and immediately they go, oh, what about this? And from the very beginning of time we've done it, Adam and Eve. Oh, it wasn't me, it was her. We, we deflect, we distract, we do all of that stuff. And so this is what she does. We think this mountain in Samaria is God's holy mountain, but you think yours is God's holy mountain. Which one is it really? She's kind of saying, well, do you know, nobody really knows. It might be yours, it might be ours. Well, I don't know, you know. The implication is we can't both be right. Maybe nobody knows. Maybe nothing is that straightforward. Therefore, maybe what I'm doing is not straightforwardly bad as everyone thinks. These distractions are often just excuses and not always relevant. God's claim on every human life is absolute and can't be avoided by questions about good and evil, which church to attend, how much worth or worse somebody is than I am, or, or which mountain is best. In fact, the point of Jesus' mission was that from then on, holy mountains were neither here nor there. They weren't going to matter. What was going to matter was him. He is quite clear that the true and living God isn't contained geographically or architecturally. Oh, this is a bit much for the women. And she probably couldn't make much sense of the idea that true worship would one day have nothing to do with territory and everything to do with spirituality and truth. And so she tries a different tack to put Jesus off. She says brightly, oh, one day the Messiah will come. Why don't we wait until then and see what he says? It's kind of like a football player kicking the ball very hard towards their own goal, not realizing that the goalkeeper's not there. Because Jesus' response says, that would be me. I'm here already. Next week, we'll see the effect of that conversation on her and her community. But for now, just a couple of things. Jesus was willing to break the rules to bring life to someone. What rules might we need to break in order to bring life to other people? Then Jesus was willing to speak to someone that other people would ignore. Is there someone you have been ignoring or think just wouldn't respond to the message who actually needs to be introduced to Jesus? Well, we have an Alpha course coming up, a great opportunity to bring them along and to introduce them to Jesus. And last, if you have the living water of Jesus in your life, where is it overflowing to other people? Amen. Part of, you know, today, 
uh, is obviously saying goodbye uh, to Stephanie and Fiona. It, it's about acknowledging that we uh, need to be good neighbors. It's about acknowledging that Jesus is in the community. It's also because we asked um, for those who are going to give us some of their favorite hymns. But we're going to sing together. The song speaks about God's kingdom, about the difference God's kingdom makes in the earth and how we play our part in that.
So go now and proclaim the gospel, not just through words, but deeds, through what you say, what you do, and who you are. May others, as they meet with you, meet with Jesus and know his living presence for themselves. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.